Hello, MBA hopefuls. Welcome to MBA Waves. This is episode 132. This is your place, or this is your program for all things business school related. And we're really excited to see you. And don't forget that if you like what we're doing here to like and subscribe for more great MBA Waves uh, information. And today on our episode, we're really excited to have Nalisha Patel. She is the GMAC European regional director. So we're excited to have her here. And I'm also here with my co-host, Hidika. So welcome, both of you. It's so good to see you. Hey, Laura. Thank you so much. Hi. So today we are talking about the GMAT because it has changed since last year. And we want to track a little bit what those changes are. And we want to see how the test has been received, how scores are looking across the board. We want to see mm -hmm. if there's any plans based on any kind of feedback GMAC has received and any lessons that they've had. So we're just going to dive right in. So Nalisha, welcome back. It's so great to see you again. And I hope it's in Europe this year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great to be back again. I was just say, going to say, like, time flies. It feels like not that long ago I was on the last one, but uh, actually a lot has changed since then. So it's great to be back on the show talking about it. Yeah, a lot has changed. So could you just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and then a little bit about the new the new test? Sure, sure. So um, my uh, role here is um, as regional director of Europe. So uh, we are a US-based company, but of course we are a global uh, organization and association of business schools. And that's how the test has evolved into what it is today, because we are very, very closely working with um, business schools across the world. So, uh, so while I look after the Europe region, and I'll tell you about a little bit about kind of what that involves in a moment, you know, this the, the focus exam has been a global rollout. And so everything we'll talk about today, of course, so there will be a European lens in terms of the people who I have spoken to. But of course, you know, I work very closely with my colleagues in all of the other regions. And so we'll be discussing a lot about, you know, how this has been received on a global level. So just to kind of reassure that that's the perspective I'll be sharing today. Um, the other thing is that so the way the way we operate is, um, you know, we have a, uh, a, a B2C, a lot of people who work B2C, so directly with the candidates, supporting people to go on that business school journey. And you might have been to um, any one of our digital properties, that could be mba.com, it could be business because to kind of get along that journey. And you could have seen us on many of our other partner sites and kind of any of those experiences and working with people like yourselves um, here on uh, on MBA Wave to kind of really educate the market to help people um, on that journey and and, and kind of alleviate the the the, the you know, the worries, the concerns, the uh, things that you need to navigate while you're going to business school. So that's not just related to the test, but that's absolutely everything on the journey. Uh, and you guys, I know, do very much the same thing. Um, the other side of the business, we work directly with the business schools. So as I said, we're an association of business schools. That's how we're able to uh, be so closely aligned with what the business school uh, requirements are. So not only uh, do we get to utilize what it is um, that they're looking for in terms of their programs, but as an extension to that, they're obviously working with employers. We work directly with employers to think about what is required in the world of business. So ultimately, the goal here is people are going to business school, they're going to be coming out and working in the world of business. We want to ensure that people are ready to go to business school and then to come out of business school. So that is our kind of a whole uh, uh, sphere. And then aside from that, we do a lot of thought leadership. We do advocacy. So we're trying to, for example, um, promote business school to underrepresented groups, for example. So we do a lot of initiatives as well on the side. So that's a very short snippet. I could go on for, for ages, but I know we need to talk about the test. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. One of the biggest um, things about the test is that it's shorter. So what was the reasoning behind making the new test, the focus shorter? Sure, that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of changes that have been um, part of this evolution of the test. And, the, you know, if I go back one step, the evolution of the test has come about because um, it's been a significant amount of time that the test has been existing in its current format or its previous format. Uh, and, you know, the needs of the business world have evolved as well. So uh, we needed to relook at that. So we have a very impressive psychometrics team who are award winning psychometrics team around the world. Um, um, and they are, um, you know, we we have been the gold standard and we have wanted to retain that gold standard. And up until now, we weren't able to give the same level of validity and predictability of those scores at a shorter level. 
um, until this point. And so that's why, because we've got that, uh, we've done the A-B testing and we're confident that that's a possibility, that's why we've been able to make it shorter. What you'll also see is there's some things that which are more focused on, okay, what the business uh, what the business environment requires. So obviously, you can see that in, our in the changes to our sections, and we'll come to that in a moment. But there's also some things that we've really picked up on on the candidate side. So one, of course, the, you know, having a shorter exam experience um, is mostly, I think, worked very well received by our by our test takers but there's a whole heap of other things in there as well that we've wanted to uh, well we've listened to um you know candidates uh learner behavior and feedback because people do kind of need to operate in those exam environments they are very stressful environments and we wanted to be able to speak to that through the flexibility in terms of the ordering the be able to being able to go back being able to take a break um and that you know there's a there's just quite a few things that we've been able to offer there that make it a much more candidate um option you know there's much more optionality for the candidate to adapt the experience for what is going to be more most comfortable for them um so that's uh, that's kind of why we've we've changed we also have a much more diverse um testing population so we needed also to address that in terms of you know the uh, how we work out our uh, our percentile scores etc and again another, another point we'll come to touch on in terms of the scoring system um but there's a, a whole heap of reasons why we wanted to uh, evolve this test and we're really really pleased uh, with the with the product that's come out at the other end yeah i'm hearing great things about it and i'm really curious to hear what what kind of feedback do you get from students in terms of after the test, are they able to give you feedback or are you getting independent feedback from students or from the business schools? How is that? What's the sort of makeup of how that works? Oh, we take a feedback from everywhere. <laughs> so um, so we'll be working, you know, we um, we go to, we support, we have a lot of our own candidate fairs. So we'll be working with them as they're doing preparation, for example. We'll be surveying people, understanding what people are going through at that point. Post-test, uh, we do qualitative and quantitative surveys. Obviously, it's been really important to us because that's a new product in the market. We've been doing social listening, so throughout the, uh, the, the web and social media platforms to understand what that kind of more informal feedback is like. And then, of course, through partners such as yourselves, through, through test prep organizations, trying to really understand... Um, you know what that what that experience has been like and you know so that we can you know any in earlier stages if there's any bugs if there's any issues that we need to resolve that we can do that very quickly um of course as i mentioned we have the candidate and the school facing team we have account managers for most of our business schools they're in very close collaboration as they have been throughout um to ensure that they have everything that they need that we're picking things up off the ground if there's things that aren't clear we're updating faqs and presentations and things as uh, as we we have been going and actually everything's been you know touch wood incredibly smooth uh we've had really positive yeah. feedback from both candidates and schools um and the wider industry as well in terms of how we've responded to uh the changing needs of of, of the of the learning environment uh and so it's been a really nice um you know of course not everyone's going to be there's there, i'm not going to say it's a 100 percent. that's that's silly but where we have seen that there might be issues or things that might you know and it's often been on a very small scale you know um specific things to do with i don't know a, a, a particular location that we've need to go in and speak to a couple of students about um but really on the on the whole it's been an uh, a, a, a incredibly positive um, rollout, and we're really pleased with it. Congratulations. Mm. That's Thank you. That's great. That looks like a great win. Um, I wanted to ask more about, you know, with just a few months of the GMAT focus coming in, and since January 31st, this is the only test that GMAT would be offering. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the actual usage of the test, and the number of people taking it and the confidence that schools have got and users have got about the test. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we haven't yet. So what we're doing, two things. I'll split that out into two, uh, two elements. So what we're currently doing is uh, building enough of a data set to have a comparator between the uh, previous GMAT and the GMAT Focus edition. So what we'll be doing is running our uh, predictions against those validity tests. So we'll be releasing that information through, uh, throughout the, the year. So we're, we're absolutely working on that at the moment. Psych psychometricians are heavy underway with that at the moment. Um, in terms of the take up, it's been really positive. Uh, we had a lot of people, obviously, who were... Um, uh, 
people who were doing admissions cycle one largely were doing the previous test. So we had a big uptake, of, you know, in the lead up to that. And then obviously um, anyone who was applying afterwards that after that, we largely were supporting them on the on the focus edition. So it was much more focused on the admission cycle and where people were on the journey rather than kind of, you know, the, the specific test as much. Um, of course, there were people who were in the position where they got to choose um, and largely they were picking the, the focus edition. So, um, yeah, as I said, as I'd mentioned before, the feedback has, has been really positive. And there's another thing that we've been able to kind of see and 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 do um, in uh, that's helped some of that, which is um, our kind of score delivery timelines have shortened. You know, that's been significant. We've reduced. We used to have three to five. Um, well, actually, that's our stated uh, timeline is three to five. But most candidates are getting their scores in just a day. And I think that's really helping um, the schools and uh, the candidates, of course, because it reduces that time of the, uh, you know, the exam anxiety. Um, so there's a couple of things that we've been able to kind of um, add on top of it that, that we weren't sure that we were going to be able to deliver, which has been really positive as well. Am I correct that the test originally, the two tests were going to be together until June of 24? Did that change at some point or am I getting that information incorrect? Was it always that it was going to switch off the way that it did? That's right. Yeah. So we'd already we'd always set an a, a, a Q1 sunset date for, for the old exam. So we were just trying to evaluate and make sure that the least amount of people were kind of it might be impacted. And we gave enough time of that crossover to ensure that people who were already starting on on the original journey were able to complete it. Got it. Got it. So do you have any data yet about how the GMAT focus is actually better than the OG, the, yeah, the OG. Uh, I mean, it's no, at, at the point, as, as I just kind of mentioned, alluded to the psychometricians are working on that kind of the, the specific predictability and validity, which is the kind of psycho, you know, the technical yeah. measures that we would offer. Um, and then of course, what we're doing is trying to compile um, some comparable benchmarks feedback that is you know that isn't just a mix of the all sorts of different feedback that we're getting to be able to benchmark people's experience against it um but we would say um that i you know i feel like that we're on a very positive track with that and i'm confident and that that the results will be positive in terms of it it having its validity and predictability and that the customer experience is going to be improved so those are going to be our key measures um and then of course we'll be able to look at what that means in terms of this, the, 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 the scores that are uh, coming out. We need a decent chunk of data in order to do that as a comparable. Uh, and I think if we get to a quarter, we'd probably be able to give something more robust in that space. So you'll have to invite me back. You are definitely going to be invited back, but we want to come to the <laughs> party. Sure, sure. Fine. Not a problem. <laughs> yeah. And the, one of the points to celebrate was elimination of the writing section <laughs> and yeah. as well as you know, but then uh, there's also been a little bit of anxiety around addition of the data insights mm -hmm. as well. Um, so can you just tell us about uh, something more about decisions around it and also anything that you can add for the benefit of the students? Of course. Yes, yes, yes. So da data insights was, you know, um, and, and if I roll back a, a step again, um, you know, we did consult with a, a number of people within business schools um, as we kind of evolved uh, the exam. And so not only were we looking to business and the industry and recruiters and the corporate recruiters um, that we engage with, we were working very closely with the business schools that we're associated with in order to ensure that what we were um, evaluating was what is required in, uh, to be a successful um, business professional. And so that's where Data Insights really, really stood out as the, one of the a really key part of uh, of that um, that learning learning environment, and so that's something that has been very much valued and, and appreciated by schools. Um, and I think the the fact that it's part of the total score it really helps people to um, it helps schools to better understand and, and assess that candidate's data literacy skills, which are critical. So that's been a really positive um, uh, element that's been received. And and again, the re the writing element that was um th that has been then received as a as a positive uh, decision as well again because that has been part of the feedback that has been given to us now of course we do have other elements um in the other sections which do kind of 
are designed to evaluate the student's language skills, especially um, kind of within the reading comprehension and the critical reasoning questions. Um, but of course, we don't have that uh, that writing section anymore. And that's because of the, the, the weighting and the overall commitment we were making to the output. That yeah. makes a lot of sense, uh, considering most of the MBA programs out there are asking for essays anyway, right? Um, exactly. Good to see you, Alicia. Sorry for being late. Me I was actually at, I was at one of your other events. I was at the oh. Mac MBA tour. Online ah, okay. Event focusing on Middle East. So uh, sorry, I'm late. I was. Two GMAC places at once. So, uh, <laughs> I often find myself in that situation. Don't worry. Right? It's so good to see you again. Have you uh, back with us on NBA Waves? Um, so sorry again for being late. But, um, you know, a, a big point of worry for a lot of people has been about the percentiles, right? So um, the I schools see. are obviously looking at that mostly to sort of put their minds around, like, how do they interpret, right? And like the yeah. table, right? With the classic. So will the percentiles change at some point? Or can you tell us about scoring, like, which on the website explicitly says, don't compare the old version with the focus. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I know. I know. The thing is, you can, you can say, don't, you can say, com don't compare, but people want to compare, right? So that's why right. we, there's two things. We're, we're, what we are, pushing schools and candidates to look at is that percentile value and that's where we're we're pushing that but we realize we can't evolve a test without providing a, par a comparator so um what i will say is uh, so two, two things three things actually so to answer your questions in sequence one the percentile values will be updated um in the concordance table annually and that will usually be done in the mm -hmm. latter half of the year so you, you will um that will account for kind of the latest population of test takers so that's the one that's one point number two is that the schools have had um coming up to 18 months of information about the the fact that there will be a new exam and they've had a lot of time uh with us to process we've worked very closely with huge amounts of um uh, uh their teams as well so not just within you know one or two people within the team that my you know people who've been uh wider uh in the organization have been out on the road they've been on school visits they've done large-scale uh training exercises we've been part of their um you know their website audits their internal processes where people have score sending um you know systems internally that feed into their applications we've been part of that so the schools are very very versed in these uh, scores already and i want to just reassure that to anyone kind of listening because i do know that i when i've spoken to a few candidates there's definitely been apprehension there particularly because we're asking people or giving the people the option to send their scores afterwards rather than beforehand if they're in a if they're in a test center which aligns with with the online test uh, and i think sometimes there's been a little bit of hesitation there because uh, i feel um sometimes candidates aren't as uh, maybe familiar with how, of how close we are working with business schools and so that's a it's something i just really want to remind people that the schools are very very much um ingrained in 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 what they're looking for and the, what they're and how these concordance tables work um where there's been any uncertainties we've responded in, uh, you know and accordingly with the psychometricians team giving really quite granular detail on the technical side of things as well where that's been required um, so they are they are absolutely not short on data. However, I do recognize and we always knew that it would be an adjustment for the market, you know, particularly as this is such a historical and, you know, it's a it's a really kind of um, uh, emotional kind of score uh, for the previous one. I, 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 I really understand that. But we feel as though, you know, what we had to do was to make that we had to make that uh, uh, that choice in order to evolve the test to make sure that we were able to differentiate, to redistribute the bell curve, and um, to recalibrate. So um, we have we have been pretty confident that that's translated across to the schools, and so we are now in very much continuing to reassure the market that that, that, that that's okay. Fantastic! Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that detail. <laughs> I still wish I could be a fly on the wall of all of these conversations you're having <laughs> with psychometricians. Um, you talked a little bit, uh, Alicia, about literacy before, mm -hmm. and you just eliminated the sentence correction. So I'm curious, yeah, yeah. what, how is the verbal section designed to evaluate mm -hmm. the student's language skills, especially since you are working with such a diverse clientele in the consumers? Yes, you know, that's a good question. And I think, you know, we, we 
we removed it in an effort to make it more relevant to business and because that sentence correction wasn't as useful uh, as assessing verbal reasoning skills. So in terms of how the two sections do um, uh, evaluate the language skills, this is so, and, and, I'll, and I'll kind of, I'll put, highlight a little bit on mba.com and I can post this in the chat afterwards because it gives a very clear, clear um, rationale. But on the reading comprehension, the questions measure your ability to understand words and statements, logical relationships between significant points draw inferences and follow development of quantitative concepts. So that you, that's where you're pulling in a little bit there. And then on the critical reasoning, the, measure, the questions measure your ability to make arguments, evaluate arguments and formulate or evaluate um, a plan of action. Um, they're based on that short reading passage. So usually that um, less than 100 words. Um, and so we kind of, we feel confident that there is enough in there that uh, that, that that gives that speaks to that, um, and we felt that that imbalance removing sentence corrects and what correction was the right thing. Hmm. Thanks. I I do I do have to say I have a sentence correction book that you've made up. Yeah. Oh no! Well, yeah. you can keep it as nostalgia. It might be worth millions it's, in the future. You just never know, Barbara. It's vintage. Like it, it will be vintage. exactly, and it's exactly. grammar, which never gets old, right? Like grammar is always important but it's i just, agree i agree it's more important than ever to be honest because uh, there's a lot of shorthand yes well, one right. thing i have to add is that i really like the granularity that you have especially at the top yes uh, which was something that a lot of people were worrying about saying that oh gmac is going to come with something like the 645 will become a 675 or will the 675 move up and so on uh, but yeah. i think that the granularity that's showing up uh, gives a lot more room at the top. It does, it does, and that's what you know. That was the that was the point, really, to provide more dis, uh, distinction across that bell curve. And I think you know we've been able to to achieve that. Um, and uh, I do, you know, I, I do think that one thing that's been a real highlight for me is to get, be able to um, re-highlight some of these things that are super important about kind of the, the elements of the test. You know, sometimes. Uh, we didn't get to talk in as much detail, particularly with the schools. You know, they, it was kind of just a, you know, uh, an update and a reminder, whereas we've really got into a lot of technical detail with schools and candidates. And I think that's a really nice thing to be, to be able to do in conversation. And so people can feel really reassured in the kind of uh, standard of the test and the detail that's involved in, in building it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, we're all smiling from the question from the audience now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Hang on, let me, let me <laughs> There's one that says that in the next iteration ha! of the GMAT, will there be an emoji section? Brilliant. Brilliant. I think I'd be quite good at that because, you know, those you get those party games where you have to guess like the song or the phrase. I think, you know, which I'll, I'll, I'll take it to the head office. Let's see what we can do. <laughs> emoji and numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Love it. Noisha, in, in talking about the scoring and the granularity of it all, how are you finding that the GMAT is being used in the marketplace? I remember that we used to tell students they should definitely be taking the GMAT over the GRE because school um, mm -hmm. employers might actually be looking at it for their jobs and they don't want to necessarily yeah. take your tests. What we're hearing now is that that's not the case necessarily. So looking beyond your your two shareholders, the students and the business schools, what are you hearing about businesses and the GMAT and how that are they are they using it from from what you're hearing? So we have definitely spent some time working with them to make sure that they're clear on what the changes are, why the changes are there and how to interpret them. So that's, you know, that still stands. And it was largely consulting firms who would be looking at those schools. And I still recommend people include that in their in their application anyway, because, you know, it's just another data point for people to have about you. And I think that's always a really strong, um, uh, good part to, to have in weight of your application. Um, we, I would say that, you know, the market more broadly, Yes, they engage not just with um, the test itself, but they engage kind of in the topics that we talk about. So you'll notice that we talk a lot about um, things that are important in, uh, in business, whether that be kind of AI, the skills, etc. So we do engage them in a range of different formats for them to understand and, and have a nod and acknowledgement and a 
um, a, a trust in the test. So there's kind of those two lenses to the way we work with those employers. But yes, um, I would say people, we, you know, we have spent a bit of time. Those haven't been as, you know, of course, our, our key stakeholders have been yeah. the ones we focus a lot of our energy on. But we have, of course, m- you know, maintained that relationship with employers and updated and, and, and educated as appropriate to those, you know, those systems. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Okay, so I have another question for you, Alicia. Sure. Do you have any data on any of the new functions of like question review and edit and select section order? Like, are students taking advantage of these things? Um, is there any insight from usage? Like, is it possible that even that there's some kind of risk in doing so? Like, have you seen any correlation to you know jumping around sections to lower scores? Like, what are we seeing here? No, great question. And so um, we. Uh, I kind of alluded to this a little bit before, but the, now that we're kind of uh, a couple of months in, we are reviewing the, the data. So we're benchmarking kind of where, what's the usage like? What are the impacts? What does it mean for uh, yeah, the, our predictions on uh, validity, predictability against the previous version? So we will be um, sharing that information as, we, as we've as we kind of com- conducted the analysis, but we just needed enough of a data set um you know in order to have a, a benchmark on that one of course okay we'll definitely have to come and visit you again sometime. yes you will you will nice okay I, I would say that, I mean, from anecdotal, I can give you some anecdotal feedback is that people have found it quite useful. And I think even if they haven't utilized it, the knowledge is there is a big reassurance and the the the, the, the kind of um, security of control, I think, makes a big difference into how people feel anxiety going into an exam situation. Hmm. I want to mention we've talked about anxiety three times on this <laughs> <laughs> and as someone who's a specialist in that and in test anxiety, it, it's super, it is super interesting. And I do, there is something about the anxiety and there's also something about gaming the system. And there's something about people feeling like, oh, if I can move around, I've got control, but mm-hmm. you actually do need to know the knowledge. Like you said, like you have to know yeah. the knowledge to do well in the test. There's only so much that moving around is going to to help you. I mean, you might feel like- yeah starting a test you're better at numbers you know like it just might that just might be who you are or you're just better at at language and so but but gaming gaming the system is just not happening on standardized tests these days it's it's just not a thing i mean it's (laughs) i think well from our intent from our intent it's that you know some people might like to do the harder the thing that they find harder first versus last or the other way around. So exactly. that's where the flexibility comes in rather there, than there being an ability to game the system because there really isn't. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately it's always about knowing yourself, right? Yeah. It's going to oh, absolutely. Knowing yourself, who you are and where do you feel the most comfortable? Like, how are you going to, how are you going to perform your best? So yeah. it always, yeah. it always comes down to that. And I, you know, I do want to say for those of you who are listening, if you do have anxiety, figure out how you're going to deal with that because it's yeah. not necessarily going to magically disappear. You might just get more, more exercise. Like you might be eating better that week. Make sure you get sleep. Like all of these things contribute to doing better in all the tasks that are high stakes. So yeah, I, that's- I absolutely couldn't agree with you more. I mean, obviously yeah. as you, as you guys know, but not everyone who's, who's listening knows, but I used to uh, run the programs at London business school. So um, I'm very uh, familiar with students who are in um, high stakes test and exam environments. And so very, uh, very used to being around that situation. And I think, you know, it's really, really important more than ever, um, you know, post COVID where everything is a screen, everything is moving, everything's a visual assault, everything's intense uh, to make sure that you can take a step back and look after your what you need in order to do your best. It's also the time that we're living in, right? Like, I wonder, I, like, I'm curious if because we do, bringing back the literacy question, like, mm. we do it with so many sound bites and memes and having to deal with things coming at us all the time that in all some time. ways we also need to, like, be able to get to a place of slowdown mm. and, and, and really take it in with that hyper focus. And yeah, because when I started teaching GMAT, we didn't have... We didn't have memes and we didn't have, <laughs> we didn't have texting that, that I remember. No, well, we didn't. I didn't have a cell phone yeah. when I began 
teaching this. So it's we're different times. Well, it's an I think it's an important it's an important thing to remember. You know, it does make a big difference to um you know, the way that we operate as human beings. So it's it's absolutely valid. Yeah. And I wonder like, you know, that how many of them use this freedom of choice in this high stakes environment because knowing mm. that they can do it, even if they don't want to exercise it, might just make it easier. I and think so. The, I think there's a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And coming to like, you know, another point, like I think which is so important, how can people win in this high stakes environment? What kind of advice do you have uh, for people to study and any new materials that are coming for them for extra support? I, yeah, I look, I think that preparation is key for everything. You know, that's not, it's, it's an age old, very cliched, boring, but uh, the, the appropriate answer, right? So it's not about, it, it's not about the weeks, it's about the quality, it's about the time that you're putting in, it's about the resources that you're using. Um, and, and knowing yourself, right, getting the time, taking the time to either speak with peers, you know, not everyone has um, tons of money I, I, to throw at, you know, uh, lots and lots of preparation. I understand that. But there is a lot of free resource. There's a lot of peer resource. And then, of course, if you are, you know, if you are able to get the support of um, of a test prep organization and to um, really invest that time into, into getting yourself ready, because it will pay off when you get to business school as well. It's not just going to be for the, the sake of the exam, actually, that I, and I do believe that I really wouldn't be I, I don't just say that because I work for GMAT. Of course, I've worked in a business school too. Um, you know, I do feel as though, you know, getting your, 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 that muscle ready to think in that way, if you, particularly if you haven't been in academia, um, business academia, or, you know, some of the areas in academia so immediately. Um, and even if you have, you know, you're adapting to a slightly different way. Um, so I do think that that, you know, that preparation is a, the really important thing and taking the time to think about what that means for you. Um, some people prepare in completely different way to others. And I think that's where you've got to take a bit of your own advice and the advice of others. You have to kind of understand what your, what, what, how, when, when's best for you to learn, when's best for you to do that preparation you know some of the graduates I speak to at some of these fairs are taking that time in the first year because they know that there's going to be exams in the second year so these are and they're very prepared people I've got I'm very impressed with them um but you know um I, I, th I think planning out some of that um that, that that activity as far in advance as you can do because as we said life is life gets really busy um and so uh, and it, and it needs commitment in the same way that business school would need commitment and then the job search will need commitment and then your career will need commitment right so um so best to kind of get that uh, get that moving. Um, and yes, I do believe we will evolve um, what offerings we give uh, out to candidates in terms of the preparation material. It's something that we're always seeking to do and to develop. Um, and so uh, as soon as we can do that, we'll be sharing that, of course, with yourselves uh, and with the wider market. Nalisha, when I think about what GMAC has done to transform this test, I, I think you've really considered very well, the needs of the test takers as well as the needs of the schools um, mm -hmm. in terms of having the exam force people to hone in on what makes the most sense for future business leaders. Um, as excited I am as about the the writing section that being gone, I'm even more excited about the data insights section being there. Now, I know I missed a little bit at the beginning of the episode, and I think for my colleagues mentioned that you've touched on this a little bit, but I really want to know some more concrete tips. What I really love about this episode yeah. is that you, you're you're sharing how things have gone so so far with test takers, with the perception of the schools. Mm. But I think people really want to know how can they be better test takers and some some good takeaways, particularly with the data insights section, which is exciting to do. You know? um, yeah. What can you share? Um, let me, I, I'm having a little thing, but one thing I will I re realize I haven't mentioned yet was that the fact that I'm trying to find it. Sorry, I'm just, I've got my laptop up, so I'm trying to find a data insight question. Um, yeah. And um, just so I've got one to, to, to refer to. Um, the uh, thing that I, I, I meant to mention earlier is um, with the report, the score report that people get back, um, <clears throat> we're offering a lot more detail in that. So I just wanted to kind of make sure that I got that I got that in. You're getting that per section and you're getting much more detail uh, in what that looks like. So I think that, that one, I just wanted to make sure that I mentioned. Um, in terms of uh, the specifics, 
Uh, we do have, um, obviously, we do have a lot more uh, of the sample questions available than we did right at the beginning, particularly in Data Insights. We heard the feedback on that, and uh, that has been um, evolved for sure. Um, I struggling to think of a specific about the about Data Insights itself, um, but I would suggest. Hmm, I'm trying to think of an insider tip. Um, that would be uh, uh, useful for the audience. Maybe I can follow up with one in the in in the, in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, we can add a, a link at the. Uh, yes, perfect. Uh, I know I do have a link that I wanted to share as well. Yeah, and speaking so still, it's the case that sorry, just to finish up what you're saying. I think it's still the case that you have this kind of starter kit, right? People can get like seventy or so questions for free. They get absolutely. the two absolutely. Yeah, so that's all. Still yeah. There. We and can, that, and that's that's the link I can definitely share. There's lots of there's a, there's lots of free materials available to people, uh, and then there's more te practice tests that are available to purchase after that. But that, yeah, I can absolutely share that. And 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 speaking of the data insights, even though yes, the test has changed a lot. Really, like data sufficiency migrated over to data insights, right? And the yes, data interpretation is as part of it, you know, the graphs and the charts. And so yeah. it's, is there any new kind of question in data insights that students should know about that just we've not seen in the original material or is it? There, my there are, there are new items, but they are not new constructs of items. So there will, these will still be familiar to anyone preparing for the exam. So that's, you know, that that's the reassurance we can provide. Um, we, I do have one, one tip. I think that, you should study for the quant before the data insights. Um, that is definitely something that we would kind of recommend was when we were talking to people face to face. That's just popped into into my head. Um, but yes, uh, in, in terms of you know we we have followed the logic of the, the the items that the psychometricians have been able to create, but just being able to adapt those into diff different uh, item types. Thanks. Yeah. There's no no surprises. No surprises. Right, right. So quant before data insights, which is exactly, you know, when, when we did data sufficiency, we wanted students to study the actual math before going into the data sufficiency and, and right. comfortable exactly. with it and then applying it to a format, right? Like you learn vocabulary before you start writing prose, right? It's kind of the similar. It makes sense. Yes. Yeah, the kind of thing. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Great. Is there other are there other things that you want students to know about GMAT focus that aren't so overt or are written between the lines? Um, no, I'm, I, I mean, I know that there's a lot there because we've kind of like thrown a lot of like, you have this, you have this, you have this. And yeah. sometimes that means the message gets a little bit diluted. Um, but I think I think if people can go away with the takeaway that, you know, uh, yeah, the user experience is something that we've really thought about. Um, in order to make that experience better, but also the feedback and the um, uh, and what you get back in terms of you know if you, your score you've got okay great, but what you need in order to get yourself ready for business school you'll also get some insights um, after the exam on that as well. So I think that's a really important um, important point to note. Um, and I will just make a little plug again to say that you know um, we are very, very uh, in touch with people about, um, with the schools and the school, uh, and everyone who's reading the schools about the scoring system and the concordance table. And so I will just reassure candidates who are listening um, that they, uh, you know, that they should just be go, going forth and, and, and being, having confidence in that space and they should be sharing their scores. Okay, what about, um, I, I touched on this before, and, and you know, it's, it's funny when you bring a competitor into the, into the, the small little uh, screen we're sharing here, but can you, can you tell students who are watching this or, or MBA hopefuls why they should consider the GMAT before the, the GRE? Or, I mean, there's even some schools that are wanting or saying they'll accept the MCAT or the LSAT. It's, there's far fewer. yeah, yeah. yeah. Why yeah. I would imagine that your main competitor, right, is the the GRE, and I don't know what the share is. I don't know if you know what the market 
share is between GMAT and GRE with business calls, but that would be a- we, uh, Well, yeah, we don't have the exacts because our data is released in slightly different ways, although they did just release, uh, release a wave of data. I mean, look, the key thing, the key differentiation is that GRE is it's a general test, right? So um, as is the GMAT is... Um, you know, built by business schools for business schools. So that is your key difference. Um, of course, you know, where people are in a market where they are looking to um, broaden the people who are going to come into their ecosystem and then make that selectivity harder, of course, people are going to be able to um, want and want to uh, look at people from uh, from from broader uh, 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 uh uh, groups and audiences. Um, I will say that that often, you know, where some where you see, you know, in the US where things are kind of test optional, or where you say, you know, would accept certain things, you know, I would say you probably need to um, think about the waiting that that will, the, the waiting you'd have to have in the other areas in order to make that a more viable bit than than a direct business school exam. Mm. Um, so that's kind of how we operate, you know, that we are a a, a specialized exam versus a general. You know what, Nalisha, you know, since COVID especially, which was a great accelerator for so many things in so many ways, <laughs> testing was not left out of that, right? And that, you mm. know, at the beginning, I, I think GMAC didn't have an option for people to take it online, and then they suddenly did. And so that's been good that filled, filled that gap. But there was a period where many schools were offering test waivers. Mm. And this, I think, is just an extension of a trend we were seeing for the past couple of decades where testing has definitely been under the microscope and like, is it valid? Is it relevant? Is it yeah. problematic in various ways? And what we're seeing now is a sort of the pendulum swinging back the other way, like Brown recently announced that they're putting the SAT back as a requirement and mm -hmm. so forth. So, what are you seeing? Like, do you, do you have any insights from your side on trends with testing coming and going, relevance not? like? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, look, you know, the the the, the test as well as kind of the the business masters uh, sector started very much as a as as a US uh, concept, and I think you know that the the the, uh, the student mobility, the rise of different programs, the diversification across different markets, the innovation that happens all across the world in different educational institutes, that has all changed the testing landscape as well, right? So where people go to study and, and, and where test taking, where, where programs uh, are more selective versus not, that has all evolved as well. Um, and I think that, you know, where we, uh, you know, that, that we don't really have it, you know, particularly the uh, the main market so in in europe there isn't really a test optional uh concept everyone does require a test if you you know if it's a major um a, a major mba or a business masters uh, and similarly for the asian schools as well so um you know it's it's it is regional um and as you say it, it it's it does it has swung as a pendulum right because people wanted to experiment and to see what those results might um m might do and and of course people are under financial pressures too right you know a lot of these organizations that um that offer these programs on are, are are um you know they they don't have endless endowments and um and do need to have certain numbers in their classes in order to continue to operate so you know we are operating in a, in some elements a commercial model uh, and so we have to take all of those things into consideration when we're looking at what that testing um uh, trend is uh, across the world you know you know if I, if i if i may um yeah, this has resulted in schools, I think, in Europe also looking at other options um, like the EA. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you, the other thing is schools that offer their own psychometrics tests, like, for example, IE in, in yeah. Madrid, they've offered their own tests for a while. There's, I think, a few more schools that have kind of gone onto that trend. Um, mm -hmm. and the difference with that is it seems that you can't really prepare for it. Like, as much prep and <laughs> goes into it, it seems like very attractive. Oh, I don't have to do anything. Like, <laughs> um, but even on MBA Waves, on several different episodes and several different occasions, we've spoken about the risks of accepting a waiver, right? What does that mean exactly? A lot of people consider mm -hmm. the chat or the GRE for that matter as one of your first MBA courses, right? It's warming up your brain for being a student again. It's been probably. Yeah people a long time the other thing is that it's often the main metric for scholarship attribution when we're you know obviously not diversity but for for merit based mm -hmm. or excellence scholarships the gmet is often the main criteria uh that, mm -hmm. that is you know so there's a risk of nothing and then in some special cases like if you're going for mbbs right mckinsey and so forth that, yeah yeah that absolutely occasionally although i'm 
I have heard whispers that is a little bit decreasing as test optionals mm -hmm. become more of a thing, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, but as someone who's worked at a business school, something I heard from a lot of my colleagues who are in the program side, right? Telling me there seems to be a direct correlation in people who either don't take the GMAT or do poorly on the GMAT who really struggle with some of the tougher courses like in finance or macroeconomics. And so there's a lot of reticence to accepting people that don't have a solid GMAT score because they don't want to set people up for failure. And, no, uh, absolutely. It's a horrible thing. I've seen people not be able to academically uh, complete a degree, and it's a massive time and, and uh, time, financial resource, emotional commitment yeah. um, to undertake such a program, as you know. And 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 it's it, it, people don't want to accept people who are going to are not going to be able to keep up, you know. So um, so yeah, you're you're absolutely right in terms of that being an important, really important step. It's not just a hurdle. <laughs> Yeah, but what, but what about the EA? Like, uh, yeah. like what would be some differences? Because they're both, you know, GMAC products, right? The GMAT and the G, sorry, and the EA are the executive assessment, which is, as it sounds, designed for executive MBA programs, unless yeah. you want to say otherwise. What about sc schools that are offering full-time MBA programs that are accepting? Mm. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, my thoughts are that we've been, you know, we worked very closely with those admissions team to decide, uh, not to decide, but, you know, to offer the pros and cons and, of, of all of the scenarios that people choose to undertake. Um, yeah. And, you know, we look at, you know, what their pipeline is, where they're looking to seek people from, what they're looking, where they're looking to grow, um, you know, what their selectivity, um, you know, levels are like. Um, and we'll always, we'll always consult people and give them the kind of honest view as to what we, what, you know, what, what's most appropriate and what, you know, what they should place more waiting on for a particular yeah. program right but you know if someone wants to use that as a, a, a you know a, a benchmark if they're comfortable with x y z other things then then that's kind of you know the whole point of admissions is a it's a holistic view at someone's kind of rounded experience and if they have those reassurances in other ways um then then we're comfortable with that yeah okay yeah, in many cases bringing the barrier down makes it easier like, again, giving the freedom of choices. And coming to choices, uh, I have seen that there's a trend in Asian schools to not accept the at-home edition of uh, GMAT focus. Hmm. What do you see in other places, in other regions? Is this going to be something yeah. that you will take into account? Yeah, of course. It's something that we always monitor, you know, everything and every layer of our test security is very important to us. And, you know, we have an, you know, we have an incredible psychometrics team. We have an incredible uh, security team who work on uh, technical things that even I'm not allowed to know about, because, of course, we have to keep that super confidential in terms of our testing, our security measures. Um, but, yeah, look, you know, I think, you know, this is not just a, 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 a G, a GMAC, GMAT related um uh, evolution, you know, wherever and, uh, you know, wherever there's a, um, you know, an, an online activity or not online, there will be um, people who do try um, to, uh, uh, to to get around it. And I think that's that's been true of kind of all of the kind of rollover to online after, after COVID, whether that be in business school, whether that be uh, all of the extra restrictions you now have to go through to get into your bank account, you know, there will always be people who are, you know, trying to get one step ahead of that, of that, um, that online world. And uh, yeah, we have had pockets where we've had to be much more, um, we've had to investigate uh, scenarios and, and work closely with local regions in order to, uh, uh, to look at what that, um, what those uh, remedial actions are. And so, yes, there have been uh, one or two relationship. And, you know, again, the, the, these have been very open relationships with us. You know, they've had conversations with us to, uh, to share and, and, and to, um, discuss with us um and often these are you know these are precautionary mem uh, measures while they what you know while things actions are taken and and they feel comfortable mm -hmm. we are winding down are there any last questions that my colleagues have or alicia that you that you want to know from us even are there any things that yeah, I mean, you know, how do you, uh, what are your initial um, experiences with the GMAT focus and, and, and how have, you know, in your communities, how's, how has it been received? My students have been really happy overall. My students have been really happy with the, the, the prep that they've been doing and the scores that they've been getting. So I've, I've had thumbs up across, 
across the board. And I've always, you know, I've always loved <laughs> being I that fan. So I, you know, I've been happy with what with what I've seen. And uh, I think, you know, it's curious that the writing section isn't part of it um, to me. And of course, I mentioned the sentence correction. Yeah. <laughs> Death. As she um, hugs onto as she hugs onto her book, uh, but but I but I but I get it. Like it does it does make sense. Um, and because anxiety was talked about so much, it is something that I wonder how GMAC really addresses that, or business schools mm -hmm. in general in the world that mm -hmm. we live in. Right? Like this is just a character that has been omnipresent. Ever you know? It's just the world we live in is is stress inducing. So. How do we infuse mindfulness and yes. being more engaged and more present um, in order to be, you know, the leaders of tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I do, I do think about that. Yeah, yeah, and we do have some kind of on the day test preparation advice, and if you go onto kind of the website and things, we do we do offer that, and even as part of our scholarship, actually, our, our talent and opportunity scholarship, we offer a uh, access to a mental health app for for the year to support you along that, you know, to, to help support you uh, along that journey. So yeah, it is very top of mind for us too. That's amazing. That's mm. amazing. I yeah, hear a couple of <laughs> So a couple of things I wanted to share was, on one hand, yeah, a lot of people have had sighs of relief, but on the other hand, you know, they've also been very um, anxious about getting everything right because the number of questions are lesser mm. and have new sections in. I'm talking about some people who had actually taken the classic before and they thought yes. the GF would be easier, but mm. the GF actually turned out to be harder for them because they weren't scored on the data insights before a kind of a scenario. Mm. Mm. Uh, so I feel that people are more anxious that they have to get more questions right uh, right now. So yeah. that's where I see it's going. And okay. to share Bara's concern, I'll be like, especially in today's age of AI, the writing section would have been like, you know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. A great way to actually see if you know it's a good good sample and and also to assess our writing skills at the moment. Oh uh, yeah, I mean that's my take on it. No, no, I think that's really valid. You know, I think you know when we started the um, the process of the evolution of the exam, it was it was before even kind of ChatGPT had even uh, released. What was that? But last January. Um, so um, so yeah, you know, and and it will continue to 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 work with schools and and look at ways that uh, people can ensure that they feel. Uh, that people do have the right writing skills of course they you know schools are having the same um they're having the same conversations with us about kind of well you know applications and essays and things like that i'm sure you're getting the same questions so i think it's a as it's a sector and a community um uh movement forward but again i'll come back to the point that you know it'll be it, there will be some um it, you, you would be kidding yourself if you were going to be able to uh, undertake a, an MBA or a business master's without actually having the the, the, the required written um, experience. And it would you'd just be kind of um, at a bit of a, you, uh, yeah, you'd be kind of letting yourself down, I think, uh, in the long run, if that was something that you, you, you really kind of tried to, and I don't believe people do. I think you know, most people use it quite, uh, as it's designed for, as a starting point, as a starting point to build upon. And I think that's that's an amazing thing for us, particularly when, you know, you're staring at a blank page and like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to write as the first word. <laughs> you know, it's very helpful in those situations. So um, I think, yeah, uh, just promoting its, its, um, its safe use is a good thing. Are we going to see a section with AI in GMAT soon? Who knows? Who knows? I, you know, I'm, the world is the oyster. <laughs> Happy to take any and all product ideas back. Uh, data insights kind of can capture that concept of using AI. There'll there'll be some yeah. questions based on. That. I mean, the whole test is kind of AI based in, in itself. It's anyway. true. We've been using AI, just not generative AI, for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So interesting. Yeah. So interesting. Well, I, Alicia, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for having me. We can't wait to see you again. And I want to thank you. I want to thank my co-hosts. I want to thank our guests for joining us. It was a, another great episode. It was a pleasure to see all of you. And MBA hopefuls, if you like today's episode, don't forget to like, 
thumbs up and be sure to subscribe to MBA Waves on our YouTube channel and on LinkedIn. And to stay on top of the latest trends, be connected with us because we've got great speakers coming up and schools coming up all about the world of MBA business, education, applying. And finally, don't forget to check us out next week, the same time, the same place. And for full access of upcoming and past episodes, head over to mbawaves.com. And bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.